the Sound Off Podcast. The show about podcast and broadcast starts now. So I have to take an inventory on what you're doing because I can never keep up. So I'll just call out the things I think you're doing and you say yes or no and then tell me if you're doing them and, and what this entails. Sure. So let's start with the morning show, which is Zoe and the Milkman. Uh, which is a afternoon show now on BTR. Nice. And you're doing BTR, which is Blast the Radio, yep. which anybody can access just by talking to a smart speaker. Pretty much. And when we ask a smart speaker to play it, what happens? What do we get to listen to? It, <laughs> you got to be careful how you say it, because if you don't say it with a little pause between Blast and The and radio it's i don't know what the station is i think it comes from japan it plays blast radio it's always an adventure but yeah you've got to be very precise in how you call it to the speaker well it could be worse you could have named your podcast sound off and then which is an instruction so oh the, no. the, the device doesn't know what to do oh matt of all the people <laughs> well <laughs> how was i supposed to know smart speakers would become a thing in 2016 They're too damn smart yeah i'm not the only one with that problem abc has a news program called start here so they're not doing any much there better. So on, on BTR, how much CanCon do I have to listen to? Um, you know what's interesting? When I started it, I went, you know what? I don't need to play CanCon. Uh, I'm on the internet. There's no regulations that apply here regarding music. So uh, initially, I launched and I played zero just because I didn't have to. And listening to it, after all the years I've spent working in Canadian radio, it just sounded so weird. And so I added it back in. I don't keep track on percentages or whatever else. I, I would guesstimate, though, Matt, just you know, listening to the station, we got to be between 25 and 30% without even trying. And BTR, it's largely the best experience to listen to is an Ottawa experience because you will speak to some of the things that are happening locally, but it doesn't really matter where. You can listen to it anywhere and it's still wonderful. I've gone back and forth, you know, on, on how I want to position BTR. Do I want it to be an Ottawa-only radio station? Do I want it to be a national uh, service? Do I want it to be an international service? And right now it's kind of a hybrid of all that. I got people, um, Jeff Michaels is doing mornings. He is Alberta ordinarily. He's in Arizona for the winter. Uh, he's doing mornings for us. I've got uh, Rusty doing an oldie show every Wednesday. He's out of Oshawa. Uh, Whitby area. I got to be careful because if he's in Oshawa and not Whitby or Whitby and not Oshawa, you know how that goes. I got contributors from all over the place. My my overnight show is Beat World Radio. So it's DJs from all over the world spinning from midnight till 6 a.m. Weekend programming comes from different places. So yeah, it's kind of back and forth. On uh, It's definitely Ottawa-based. It's definitely Ottawa-influenced. That's where it started unabashedly. I mean, I've taken on other responsibilities too. So full disclosure, I'm not on BTR nearly as much as I used to be. I'm doing a, a every noon hour I record with Zoe. She's on her lunch break. Um, and we've gone back and forth even on that show. Do we try and make it something that's going to go after uh, syndication? Should we be heard internationally? We're going to market this thing in the States. And listen, I I've been listening to a lot of your conversations with people I respect like Aaron Davis and uh, Terry and Ted, etc. And, you know, the conversations they have about their realization being in the podcast space, especially that I'm not in Joe Rogan's world. I can't monetize this the same way if I'm trying to be that big, but I, I do have great relationships locally. So why don't I just do an awesome podcast that is local? And especially with all the cutbacks that are going on with news, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there's an opportunity there. And I've really listened to that and taken that to heart. So with Zoe, we've taken a step back and revisited the show. And we're really full on right now with making sure that it's a full hour, six breaks in the hour, and as much local conversation as we can. So one of the words that keeps coming up in the podcast world is the idea of community yep. and i guess you would know this better than anybody because you started one of the first radio communities just with milk prep way back in the day <laughs> i know we, i keep going back to this but you know how it all comes around people are like well how do i how do i monetize my podcast or how do i monetize my business and you know the uh, this idea of commu community is really where it's at it's not just a bunch of people who listen to your station and saying okay you're part of a community it's the people who will interact with your brand and you and what you're doing. You know, it's funny. I never thought of milk prep like that. And you got to be a certain vintage to remember it being called milk prep. But yeah, that's how it started. When you say community, my first thought is when I launched BTR because I just, it was happenstance. I lost my job at Bell Media after 23 years. I was sitting around and flipping through my phone and I stumbled upon an app from a uh, mix. LR is the name of the company, and it was just broadcast yourself. And I thought, wow, that's kind of neat. And they've got this little interface in your phone. So, I, you know, I, I got a studio. All I need to do now is figure out how do I get the studio plugged into my phone. 
because I'm an idiot and I didn't go looking for their website to see if there might be a web interface, which there is. Anyway, Jerry rigged the phone. But all this to say, they include a chat room with their service. Now, if you had to ask me when I was launching the radio station, would you like a chat room with that? I would have laughed and laughed and laughed. Yeah, sure. ICQ is online too. Why don't I just add that back to things? I never would have added it. It ended up being the very thing that put us on the map because people got to engage with the radio station, got to engage with the performers. And it was wild. I mean, there were days we'd get 500 people in a chat room just talking about the day, talking about the music, talking about what was going on. And from there, it grew into Twitch, which, again, has a chat component to it. So it's it, my first thought about community is that. But you're absolutely right. Milkman and Milk Prep, um, very much a community. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait. You do Twitch? I do. Tell me how that works, because I've only had a few people on that, that can talk to it. Don Collins well, was... Well, he'd be the guy. One, yeah, he was the guy at one point who was, who was spearheading, let's get some radio and content creators on t- onto Twitch. He's no longer well, he's there. he's who recruited me to Twitch. Uh, yeah. And so tell me about the Twitch experience. So Twitch is owned by Amazon. Don't know if people know that. Uh, Originally a platform that went after gamers. So, I mean, if you like hockey, you can watch the NHL on TSN, Sportsnet, etc. You've you've got, you know, lots of places to see that. Uh, Football, baseball, basketball, the same thing. But gaming is so huge. And if I'm a gamer and I want to watch really good gamers play and, and draw tips from that and make my own, you know, gaming better, Twitch was that space. Amazon saw an opportunity to go after YouTube, and uh, they and Dawn had some sort of conversation somewhere. How it happened, I don't know. Um, but they wanted to go after performers and, and build that space and create an opportunity for them to monetize what they were doing. The problem, of course, is when you're doing music-based radio, well, how do I get onto a platform like Twitch? As we know, you can't even play you know, the song that's playing in the background of the grocery store without Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, muting you because you don't have rights to the music. Well, Don made that happen. He had the conversation saying, look, I'm going after radio people. You want me to get performers on here? Uh, we got to give them, you know, a little wiggle room on the music. And Twitch has, has given us that wiggle room. So we've been able to stream music on Twitch. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't ask questions. We, we've we just been able to do it. Um, but Twitch was interesting, especially when you're doing talk programming, which I did a good bunch of a while back i had the legendary lowell green on with us he and i were doing a talk show together and twitch again offers a chat room and it offers you a chance to monetize so the way that works you get the twitch app on your phone you go to your app store and you buy what are called bits right it's a currency and if i really like what anybody on twitch is doing i can donate my bits to them and the person, the performer, gets a check at the end of the month. Amazon will actually deposit that. The other cool thing about it, if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber and you really like a certain person's channel, you can go on and say, this is my favorite Twitch channel. It doesn't cost you anything more. Amazon Prime actually gives the channel owner five bucks a month on your behalf. So it was a great way for me to make a couple of bucks when I really needed to make a couple of bucks. But it really works best when you're actually doing engaging content. Us just playing music on Twitch, eh, doesn't catch an audience at all. So you must be recruiting talent all the time for BTR. I try. It's a different space though, right? And I understand this. People are, there's a lot of really talented people out there who would love to be back on the radio in some way, shape, or form. Of course, as you and I know, we're doing this from home right now. You can do radio from home right now, but they want that paycheck. How much is this going to pay me? Well, the opportunity I offer is very different. I've got the website. I pay for the app. I pay for the music licensing, I pay for the automation software, all of that is done. So you don't have to worry about any of that. And whatever you sell for your show, you keep. But that's where it kind of falls apart. People get really freaked out at the idea of having to go and sell what they do, which I get it, but is that really any different than when you sit down at a job interview? You're asking for the job. You're asking to get paid. But you're better than the rest of us at that because you've been receiving checks since about 1995 for things and the rest of us have not been doing that. Like You understand it's a business. You've explained it to people that it's a business. In fact, I've seen you go on milk prep and say, hey, everybody, the classifieds part is a business and I'm sorry you don't like the blind box, but that's just the way it goes. And I'm sorry that you don't like this company. I don't need you banging on the people who are paying me money. This is a business. So you come as pre-programmed to, to be a little bit in sales here. The rest of us do not. You know what's ironic about that? My very first professional job out of college, I always knew I could be on the air. Like, I always knew that. Like, day one, John Henderson at Loyalist College tapped me and said, 
you're going to fill in for me Saturday and Sunday mornings on CIGL. And I know Erin Davis was just talking about her experience at CIGL. Brought back some great memories of the Cala music, reel-to-reel systems, etc. My first year, he, yeah, he picked a first-year student to do that. So I knew, like, on-air was inherent to me. Even in high school, I was DJing and, you know, doing some radio stuff at the local university station. So I knew I could fall back to that. Anyway, I got into sales. <laughs> And about eight months in, the general manager and I sat down and we agreed that, you know, John should never, ever, 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 ever try and sell anything anywhere, anytime. He's horrible at it. So ironically, yeah, in a roundabout kind of way, I guess I do have to sell. Look, I mean, if you want to eat, if you want, if you got bills to pay, you got to figure out a way to get paid. Asking for money is not a dirty thing. The person working at the convenience store down the road, when you want to buy a pack of gum, they're going to ask you to get paid. My money. Give me my money, please. It's not a dirty thing. People need to get over it. And people in radio need to remember, too. You are in sales. Even in an on-air capacity, you are in sales. You're selling me on your music being better. You're selling me on your format being better, your weather being better. Everything you do on the air is sell, 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 sell. The only difference is how much will you pay me to do this? A lot of people don't know this unless they follow you closely on social media. And that's you have a station vehicle. (laughs) <laughs> is that not the best like, story? There are some stations that don't have station vehicles. Well, that's true. Okay, the the, <laughs> the short story on that is I've always had a vision. It, 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 listen, we saw it back in the what, 70s, 80s. There were a lot of stations that used RVs that they modified into mobile studios that they'd show up at you know the Central Canada Exhibition with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, live on location. So I've long had a dream that, gosh, you know, how cool would it be to have a big honking vehicle with signage that could show up at events, be a real community service partner with a PA system and everything that comes with it. And I happened to mention that I still had this dream, but then I said it could be a podcast studio and a broadcast studio. And what I would really love to do is tie in a mental health component to this, because I'm someone who's had a long, very public battle with depression and anxiety, and I've been very, very lucky that I've got great coaching and great support, and I, I'm, I'm in a really good place. I'm okay. So I give back to mental health charities and and foundations and fundraisers whenever I can. So I thought, let's get this thing on the road. If I can find a cheap RV, let's get it on the road and let's do a podcast where people, when we're set up at community events or live on locations, can just drop by and have a conversation, five minutes, half an hour, whatever, about their experience with mental health. Well, a couple approached me. They said, we bought an RV a couple of years ago. Our intent was to retire and travel. Well, my husband's sick. The thing's been sitting in a field for four years. It's got squirrels living in it. It's pretty run down, pretty nasty looking. We were going to put it on Kijiji for six grand, but we love the idea that you've got. It's yours for three grand. Okay, now I just need to find three grand. So I put it out there on social media. Here's my dream. Here's the opportunity. Within a few hours, I had raised close to $7,000. We acquired this RV. It's 28 feet Matt, it sat in a field for four years. It literally had squirrels living in it. It was badly vandalized. It had been broken into. People took the fire extinguisher and just coated the entire dashboard, every nook and cranny with that stuff from fire extinguishers. Mud, dirt, everything. The cabinets ripped off the hinges. And I spent uh, two winters ago just putting this thing back together again, gluing it, deep cleaning it, etc., and by spring, we had it on the road. So, yeah, it's a 28-foot RV. It's called the BTRV for mental health, donated exclusively to us from our listeners and a good base of really great local businesses in Ottawa. And we went to all kinds of events last year, from Ottawa to actually Peterborough would be as far south in Ontario as we got. So Peterborough, Kingston, Ottawa, uh, all through Quebec and all the way to New Brunswick. And back again. Really, really amazing. I think I want to play therapist for a little bit. Okay. Because you mentioned therapy. So let me go back and ask you to go back to how much time was it between when you were let go from radio? And when I mean radio, I mean Bell, Mm -hmm. because I think you were at Bob at the time. And and when you went to a therapist's office and the therapist said to you, who, who is John without radio? And then that caused a little panic inside So that you. happened a little later. Yeah. Um, but what was, how, how much time between being let go and then that happening? Two years? No, no. Three or four months. Okay. So I, I had a battle with depression. 
Um, I had my breakdown live on Bob FM live during Bell Let's Talk Day. Every I'd been sick for a while. I've been going to see my doctor. You know, went through the stress test, heart test, everything. Um, but nothing was turning up. You know, you're a little heavy. You've got some cholesterol issues. But you know what? You're also in your 40s. This is normal stuff. This is nothing we can't manage. But nothing out of the ordinary. And on that day, there was just you know the conversations that I was hearing were ticking boxes. And suddenly, by the end of my shift, I'm going, Oh my God! I I think. I've come to a realization here. And I called my doctor. I said, I need to see you this afternoon. And it just became overwhelming. So I had a breakdown on the air, was off for three months, was back on. Fast forward to, yeah, they let me go. It was traumatic because nine days earlier, pardon me, my wife, who had worked for Sears for 22 years, lost her job. We knew that was coming. She worked for an amazing boss. The writing was on the wall at Sears. And she says, my job is to get you out of here with some money, which fortuitously they did. So we had accounted for that. What we didn't account for was that nine days later, nine days later, on my first day off on two weeks vacation, can you come in for a meeting? Really? Okay. So that was late October. By December 2nd, 3rd, I had launched BTR. And I launched it because the conversations I'd been having about my mental health online They needed to continue. I couldn't just walk away from that audience and into that platform. So that's where it launched. It was around tax time in the spring. So Sue had her severance. I had my severance. And we went to see the accountant, take care of our taxes, whatever else. And the guy got up from, I was just having a bad day of depression. I was really in a bad spot already. And dragged my butt into his office. He got up and he high-fived me for all the money I had made that year. What was two severance packages? (laughs) It wasn't It wasn't a celebratory opportunity, and it damn near killed me. It was later that afternoon I admitted myself to the hospital. I called the distress center. I said, I, I'm not coping well with this. And they actually stayed on the phone with me. They called ahead to the hospital. He's coming in. We're worried about this guy. So, yeah, I was in the hospital on a three-day security watch, and it was in the hospital uh, sometime. It's all a blur. But the first night... The on-call psychiatrist had a conversation with me just to sort of, you know, what's going on here and start putting things together. And I guess I had said something in the conversation about, oh, I have these conversations about mental health on my radio show. Okay. Well, he's back the next day and we're talking again. And within a few seconds, I said, I know exactly what you're saying. I bring this up all the time whenever I bring mental health up on my radio show. And he snapped his fingers at me. He said, okay, we're going to cut the bullshit. Do you do this with your regular therapist? Because if you do, I'm calling your regular therapist. And I'm going to point this out. You're not going to do it with me. He says, everything that you talk about is radio. It's radio, 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 radio. We're going to take radio away from John. Now, who's John? Scare the hell out of me. (laughs) Because this is all I've ever wanted. I mean, you talk to so many people. They all have the same story. It's all we've ever wanted to do. My earliest memories were sitting in front of the radio listening to Ken the General Grant on CFRA, marching me off to school. But, I mean, it, it took me forever to sort of unravel that. You know, who was John? I haven't had to think about it. And I knew what he was saying. And whenever I put it out there, people are like, oh, John's this, John's that. But at the foundations of it, it's like, no, no, no. there's got to be more to you than radio. Have you ever examined you as a human being and what you value Etc. You know all the things we talk about in radio. You know about being relatable, etc. What is it that you know ties you to a community? What other things do you like that you can talk about on the radio? Because you don't talk about radio on the radio. So what are those things that you really hold near and dear? And it took me a good seven years to kind of come up with an answer, which I'm finally going to put down on paper. I've got a book coming out, and the book is actually called "Who Is John." And the entire point of the book, tell my story a little bit, absolutely. Hopefully offer some inspiration, whether you're in a radio capacity or broadcast capacity at all or not. Just that it's never the end. That if you're creative and you're good and you're smart and you're willing to take a risk, there's an opportunity for you to move past, to, you know, still do what you feel you were put here to do. And in the book, I answer the question, who is John? Because there is a lot more to me than just radio. There's so much that what is done in radio and what we're doing now and anytime you get behind a microphone that is tied to identity. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure if you have a lot of dreams that would involve wallets, backpacks, things like that. It's more of a female thing, like 
purses, for instance, <laughs> their identity is a little bit attached by what's inside those things. Yes. I study the Jungian dream stuff all sure. the time, and I'm not quite sure what it is for, for males so much. But yes, I find many of the settings for dreams that I have are still inside radio stations, mm -hmm. even though I'm long gone and haven't been inside a radio station and getting paid at the same time in, in over 10 years. It, that's still a thing. So I, I bring it back to identity and, you know, who is John? Well, you're immediately looking for a little bit of identity right there. So, but we, we spend every waking moment in the radio career shaping identity of the radio station, yep. of personality, of what are you going to do in this break? How's it going to make people feel? And what, and how can I identify with people? Everything just comes from that. So I, I, I look forward to your book. Yeah. I, I look forward to it being out there too. And I've been putting little bits and pieces here, just, um, you know, not, not getting into the heavy stuff and, you know, suicide attempts and all that stuff. That'll be in the book. Um, but certainly some great memories I have of people that I've met. Rick Dees. Um, I, I got a great story coming out in the next little bit about um, how being the Rough Rider Rooster mascot actually led me back into radio and got me the job at Cool FM with Chum, which, you know, Bell Media acquired, and I was there for 23 years. So, you know, fun little things like that. So th those are that's one chapter in the book, and each one is sort of a, a little story within it. But I've been putting that out there because I really do want to have a light side to this. I really want people to read the book and have a laugh along the way in what has been a pretty dark period of time that really inspired the book in the first place. So a few more things as my therapy session with you continues. Yes, so when Bell... And I'll single out Bell because it happens with them more often than not. But layoffs in general, when they occur, I get a little bit out of sorts. Like I wake up bothered and I said, well, I've got a business to run, but I'm still bothered. And you're also exceptionally bothered by it. Yes. And a lot of people, like people will start texting me. Everybody who has been through the experience of it will start to text me or we will all start to talk or we will congregate and often it could be on the Facebook group that you run. It could be anywhere, just people talking about, oh, this shit again. Mm -hmm. This is all happening mm -hmm. again. And I feel that people are being re-victimized, that they know what the people who are getting let go are going through okay. and feel this empathy for them. And a lot of it too, I'm sure you'd agree, is just we all have such passion for this business. We already talked about that. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're how many years out of the business and you still think about it. You haven't been in a radio studio in forever, but you still have dreams about it. And I think that's lost on some of the bigger companies who don't have that intimate uh, association with radio. They didn't grow up wanting to be in radio. They saw a business to acquire, which helped them promote other things. It, it, it's always, and I hate the word triggering, but it's it's the buzzword du jour. It, it is very triggering for people who've been through the experience because, in, in, and I get probably to my detriment, not probably, absolutely to my detriment. Look, I run Milkman Unlimited. Bell is a company who has been very good to me. As far as that partnership is concerned, they have continued to advertise job postings with me. And I've had to walk a very fine line in that, right? Because I worked for them. I was let go by them. I was traumatized by being let go and afraid of losing my house and, and you know, watching the health package that I had disappear and not being sure what's mm -hmm. what and all this confusion, whatever else. But I've still got to be in business with them. And i got to walk that fine line. And i got to be careful. Yeah. And I will get carried away because I've got such passion for the business. And because I've got such empathy for people who have been affected by this. I understand. And it's easy for them to say, it's not you. This is just business. It's not just business. The, this is people's lives. And the impact that it has is devastating. So... I do get my back up and I do get very vocal more and more so lately because I'm not afraid to say it anymore. Maybe it has something to do with my age. I'm 55 now and I just, I see it differently. And if, if it affects the business, it affects the business, but damn it, I got to stand up for radio at this point because it's such an important thing with all that's going on in the world, not just radio, media in general, you know, and in the news side of things. I've always viewed the news departments as really the official opposition to the government. They are the ones asking the questions on behalf of Canadians. And to watch that evaporate, I don't even want to say heartbreaking. It's maddening. It's infuriating. See, I get all riled up just at the thought of it. Yeah, I know. And listen, there are people watching this saying, what are these crybabies all about? And I'm here just to tell you that this is not like getting let go from the bank. You are asked every day to go in and to shape and to be and to be empathetic and to reach out and touch someone and you know put it all on the line. And in a moment, it's gone. 
And that's, that's very, very difficult for people. And I've had so many people on this podcast, yourself included, Marianne Iveson comes to mind. People who, when they talk about the process of getting let go, have broken down in tears because it is not the same as I got let go from the bank. I'll just go to the other bank. It's not what you're being asked to do every day. Being let go from any is, job is traumatic. Yeah. Right. Yes. This, this one, especially a little bit more though. I don't know of anybody who has ever worked at a bank. I don't know of anybody who's ever worked at a law office or retail who's been called in on their day off. It happened to be my day off. Okay. But not just me being called in the entire on air staff being gathered together in the boardroom where the program director who you reported to wasn't even in the room. You've got the general manager and vice president of the company reading from a script an HR person you have no relationship with who's been flown in to deal with this. We thank you for your service at the radio station. It's just business, but we're going in a different direction. Moments ago, we flipped the switch and we are now a country station. And then as a team, and we're a team, had to go stand in line outside the HR office and wait our turn while our now former co-workers walked by saying, the hell's going on? And wait for some person you don't even know to hand you a package and tell you how sorry you are that they had to be there on this day to do this to you. It's cold, it's callous, it could have been handled so much better. Like, it was literally a month or so earlier, the same guy that read that script and let me go was handing me an award for 23 years of service. Don't, yeah. don't do that to people. It's awful. Like, yeah. you had to have known two weeks earlier, a month earlier, that this is going to happen. That more than anything bothered me. Look, we all know, if you watch WKRP in Cincinnati, it's all Johnny Fever talked about. <laughs> Being fired from a radio station, no big deal. I'll move on to the next radio station. Easier then than it is now, right? You've got a lot fewer options now, but that's the business. You haven't really worked in radio unless you've been fired. We all expect it. We all know it's going to happen. We all understand that formats change and things change, but to gather us as a group and do that, that's what really hurt me the most. Let's just touch a little bit on news because you mentioned that it's so important to keep government in check and there's less and less of it. Yep. So when I was in radio back in the olden days, which was about, you know, maybe up to 10 years ago and longer. <laughs> we I'm all quickly knew. come to that realization that, yeah, 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 I was in radio a long time ago, nine years ago. A lot's changed. But news was never a moneymaker. No. And now Bell is saying, well, we can't make any money on it, so we're going to get rid of it. And I'm like, no, your promise of performance is to inform and, and That's exactly put the news on the it. air. That's exactly And you make, you. Your, you make your money... By playing the hits. I, I And at some point they got, somebody went and said, well, we'll just, you know, count differently and we'll put all the news in one pile and said, well, look at that. We're losing money. We, we can't sustain this. News what is what gives about? your station, especially in TV, that's what gives your station the identity. You talked about your memory of CJOH broadcasting live from the Central Canada Exhibition. Max Keeping, Carol and me, and the whole gang was there. JJ was doing the weather the whole nine yards. JJ and Clark. And people stood there and watched the news from Lansdowne Park. They were mesmerized by it. It was that connection to the community. Look, news is never going to make you money. Absolutely. But it's not that. It's, and you said it exactly right. It's the promise of performance. It's the... We want to be in the broadcast business. We require a broadcast license to be on AM, FM, or television. As part of our request to be granted a license on the public airwaves, we promise to serve the community, and here's how. X number of hours of news, which is the biggest connection to the community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they just dismiss it as if it doesn't matter. Except it does. It's the be-all, end-all. It's everything to a TV station. And what you have now, because you look like you're in a radio station, you've got the, you've got a radio in back of you in the radio station. You've got a set, another microphone over there. I love what you've done with the place, John. Do you think of yourself as a radio station? Because I nope. do. I, so why not? Because here's how I interact with my devices. I will ask to listen to 1071 The Peak, which is a great radio station out of Hudson Valley, New York. Or I will ask to listen to BTR and I will ask slowly and properly in order to, to receive it. I can do the same in my car. My presets are in my head. I will ask said devices to play me this stuff. Or if I'm in the car, I will use TuneIn or I will use the iHeart app. But you're as much of a radio station as anything else. So I, I look and listen and it all feels the same okay, to me. So if your question is, do I think of BTR as a radio station? Yes. 100%. Yeah. Do I think of myself as a radio station? No. I think of myself as a radio visionary. 
as an entrepreneur because I'm not just doing BTR, as you know, and we haven't had a chance to get to that, and I'm sure you're going to. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in this room. This tiny little room in my basement is a very, very busy place every single day, and it extends beyond here. I've got, you know, a voice booth outside where I do station imaging and commercial voiceovers for clients, etc. So, no, I don't think of myself as a radio station. I, I think of myself as someone... Yeah, for the longest time, it was radio, radio, radio. I've really come to understand that I'm in a different space now. Radio's part of it. I'm a broadcaster, but I'm, I'm someone who's really gravitating to everything that the internet has to offer. And the one thing I really do recognize about myself that I didn't understand for the longest time, I have a really uncanny ability to see where things are going. I'm way ahead, and I stand back, and I get very frustrated, because why can't people see what I see? And I actually had a listener say that to me years ago. She says, your problem is, you're already in the end zone, celebrating the touchdown, and the 23 other players on the field, they have yet to realize the ball's even been snapped. Like, you need to recognize that about yourself. So because I have this intuitive understanding of the Internet and how it can be harnessed and how, how we can harness podcast and Twitch and all of these things to make radio as the foundation really leap into the minds and imaginations of listeners again, I don't see anything happening on that front every single day. I don't see other people standing up going, here's how to do this. Let, you know, let's get excited. My 21-year-old niece is living with us while she goes to university. She and I talk about radio all the time, and she laughs at me. The amount of work a radio company would have to do to draw her age group back to that medium is, I don't know how you even begin to do that. It's got to be so unbelievably compelling and exciting. And where do you even market to them? Social media, I guess. But, I mean, it's it's such a lost opportunity that, I mean, we were all in on conversations where, look, it's, it's the 25 to 54-year-olds. We don't care about anything younger. That's where the money's at. And we didn't groom new audiences. So, no. yeah, I, I, I don't think of myself so much as a radio station anymore. I really want, it's the how. It's, it's <laughs> how to, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. How do I bring all of this vision that I have to use video components and podcast components and bring this all together and really, you know, make it the magical thing that it always has been. What else is BTR that we haven't spoken about yet? Because I know there is some podcast in there. Well. Yeah, there's a lot of podcasts going mm -hmm. on. There's a lot of voiceover work going on here as well. But just me personally, so I'm voice tracking a ton of stations every single day from here. So my day starts at 5.30 a.m. I'm up and I'm on the bike for a little bit. I'm in the studio by 6. The first order of business is uh, making sure that my show notes from the night before are still applicable. <laughs> has really changed overnight. Um, but from 6 till about 7, I'm voice tracking for a station that I work for in Sarasota, Florida. So I'm the midday guy at WSRQ, which is a classic, well, 60s, 70s, 80s classic hits. A lot of fun yeah. to do that. Every now and then they've got me filling in on their station in Erie, Pennsylvania as well, which has been a real good experience and one of those things that whenever the topic comes up of, oh, listen, voice tracking, man, I don't know about voice tracking. It's got to be live. It's got to be local. Well, yeah, but when you voice track and you do it right and you really immerse yourself in a market, the tools I'm using to be local in Sarasota are exactly the same as the tools I'd be using if I was actually local in Sarasota, right? I'm There's a traffic accident on I-75. Well, I'm going to fire up the highway patrol cameras. I'm going to see what's going on. I'm going to report that back. I can. It's not in real time, but it's a minute or two after I voiced it and uploaded it. So, middays on WSRQ, I take a little break there, grab myself a little breakfast, and then I'm back in here and I voice track the afternoon show uh, for FM 101, FM 92, FM 101.5, Milton, Orangeville, Simcoe, Ontario. It's one show, three stations. Take another little break in there, and then I voice track the afternoon show that airs on Mix 106.5 in Owen Sound. So that's my day. Then I get back into the studio at noon. Zoe and I record then. She works in real estate full-time, so she spends her noon hour with me. We do six segments that then air on BTR between 2 and 3. I edit that down into a podcast, isolate the video clip. The video clip goes on to social media to help promote the show. And then I'm on to podcasts, et cetera, that I've taken on that uh, I've also got the responsibility for. So this is much more than just BTR+. Plus. I'm doing the music scheduling, the commercial scheduling, the commercial writing, the commercial production. <laughs> it's a busy little place. So in summary, this all appears that you're very viable. <laughs> Isn't that shocking? 
Yes. I didn't want to let the episode escape us without working that word into the whole thing. It's that word is forevermore. What did you think when you heard Robert Malcolmson say that, you know, radio is not a viable business? You follow me on social media, you know damn well what I thought. How dare yeah. you say that? And what a slap in the face. I would love to sit down for a beer with some of the people at Vista and, and John Pohl and MBS, you know, Mr. Pace and, and, and all who on that very same day, just forked over a ton of money and signed an agreement to take over the radio stations, and then they're told the radio stations you just bought, yeah, you just suckers. <laughs> I mean, exactly. <laughs> and by the way, we're reco- I don't know when you're going to put this on, but as we're recording this, I am aware of more layoffs that happened today. I can't say where, but I know that the owner of the radio station put the wheels in motion for the layoffs because, gee, Bell says this isn't a viable business. Maybe I better get out. The repercussions of that comment are just unbelievably damaging to this entire industry. And and yeah, can you imagine you buy a car from someone and as you're driving down the driveway, they're like, ha, 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 you bought a beater, bye. How angry yeah. would you be? Oh, and you also still have employees, by the way, who well, are still working and getting a paycheck from you and you just called what they do. You're not uh, They are now working and not a viable business. Radio is a viable business, but... You, but oh, is it ever? But, but it has to be run. You have to have an understanding of what it can do and yeah. what you want it to do. I'm not seeing a lot of evidence of that. I see a lot of commercials on TV for radio, and that's nice. And I'm, I'm going to set myself up again for probably a little bit of a slap in the wrist for this. I don't care. How in the hell do you hire Tarzan Dan? Put him on 22 radio stations. And I love the guy. He's one of my best friends. Put him on 22 radio stations. Have him do the media tour for an entire week, appearing on every single newscast that CTV has, local. And then Super Bowl Sunday rolls around. You've got the broadcast, but the commercials you're airing for Bounce are still just talking about, we play 80s and 90s. You couldn't even revoice that to mention Tarzan Dan? <laughs> You you hired a gold mine. Well, you know what? For the very first time in my life, I can listen to Tarzan Dan terrestrially in the place I live. Right? For the very first time. And I'm, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get in the car and go listen to him on 99.9 here in Winnipeg. We just talked. Looking for that marketing opportunity that will bring people yeah. back to the radio. It's stuff like that that, you know, when it's not a viable business. It is. When you pay oh, yeah. attention to things like that, to yeah. me, that's a huge missed opportunity. And then, of course, the next day the ratings come out. Biggest viewership in the history of the Super Bowl in Canada, and you didn't tell anybody about this person, this legend that you just hired for 22 of your radio stations. It's yeah. viable. It is viable. And the new owners recognize that, and will do a great job yeah, with very it. Very astute of you, by the way, to have to have thought of that. If you'd run down the hall Friday at 5, I would have worked late to make that happen. I mean, what would it have taken to re-image that and, and re-upload that? Nothing. Oh, things. there are changes that happen all the time. And I'm like, let's see if anybody is going to come in and fix that for the weekend. Let's say they move like the time of a sporting event or something like that or an NFL game or something. So let's see if anyone's going to come in and fix that. And then often they don't. Mm. I know I would. They should. If it, yeah. mat- if well, it matters, I, you, know, you would. Yeah. It has to matter. And, and, I, know, and that's, that, that's I gotta, the thing. If it's not a very viable business, it's because it didn't matter to you. I have a, a radio station in town, a bell, a bell station, as it were, that got refunded. They just turned it off. And I thought to myself, it's an AM station. The frequency is 1290. There was a sports station there. Then it was a funnies station, a comedy station. That was a cop-out. And then, yeah, now it's nothing. And I thought, would I buy that for a dollar? And I don't think I would buy it for a dollar. AM, no. Yeah. No, back back in the day, there was you know some thought to hanging on to AM stations because it, it would give you an advantage when everything moved. Well, everything moved digital, but not in the way we thought it would, right? Digital for yeah. conventional broadcasters is now the addition of a, a stream online, on a smart speaker, on an app. I can't get too upset with any broadcaster wanting to take AM off the air. You could have a very, and this is a, a quote from Rob Farina, who I used to work for years ago, but I love the quote. You could have a really, really great store in a dead mall. There's nobody coming to your store. And that's the AM band right now. There's The sound quality isn't there. The expense for, what is it, five, seven transmitters to run an AM station, uh, seven times the power, etc. Uh, it's cost prohibitive. Unless you can flip it to FM, I, I, I wouldn't touch an AM station, even if I had the, that dollar. No way. And who knew I'd be coming to you for business advice? I like that. <laughs> Thanks. It's a good relationship. But we, we bounce a lot of stuff off each other. Hey, you said bounce. I like where you went with that. <laughs> um, You're welcome, Bell. See, I'm not such a bad guy after all. Yeah. Uh, yeah because you said bounce, you got to pay them out for it. The classified ads that, that come into mm-hmm. you, that you post, the job postings, what trends are you seeing in terms of what radio companies are looking for? Doesn't matter if they're big or small. What do you, what do you see? 
The demand for news people really stands out to me. And that's the thing I hear from employers all the time is they're just not getting enough applicants for news. Whether there's not enough people interested in doing news or what, but that's the biggest frustration. That's the biggest trend right now is, and that's what I have the most job postings up there for news that is in demand conversely i'll have a conversation with a radio station i'll say well okay you're in a difficult spot you need somebody yesterday you're in a remote location you can't pay somebody a wage that you know is probably going to allow them to do this and do this only they're going to have to take another job are you open to them working from home oh no nope they've got to be here do they in 2024 do they have to be there i i understand you want them to go to the city council meeting and that's all well and good, etc. But can they not source that online and still report on it? I, I'd be looking at that option. If I was really stuck for newscasters right now, I would really be looking at the freelance option. But that's the biggest trend is, mm. is the need for news right now. Are you optimistic about radio? Because you mentioned that there are a lot of people who are buying radio stations. We talked about Vista. We talked about John Pohl, who had a big launch earlier this year, actually a year ago with the radio station. Canadian to own an American radio license. We see Maritime Broadcast, they're expanding. That's exciting stuff for them. It is. I think that when you look at all that, there's got to be some reason here to be optimistic about the future. Initially... Because they're all good people. They really are. Yeah. They, they really are. I've got great relationships with all of them. I, I've met with Robert Pace and his team uh, on occasion when I'm down east. I've got a cottage there. I've got uh, my wife's family's down there, so I've always got an opportunity to drop in on MBS, and I have and for a long time. Vista, I've got great relationships with a lot of the hierarchy there, and they're a good sponsor of ours as well. John Pohl and I met years ago at Algonquin. I'm a big fan of what he's doing. Yes, I'm incredibly optimistic about radio. Initially, when the announcement came down, you know, you see the headline. Bell gets rid of 45 stations, gets rid of more people, and it just it sparks fuse again, and you get angry, and you get frustrated. This thing that I love just got beat up again and it just keeps happening over and over but once and you were one of those people to sort of say hold on a second be on the headline look what's really happening here people stepped up and said i do value this and i've got a plan for this now is it going to be staffed around the clock like radio used to be with an overnight show and a live evening show etc probably not but i look at who has purchased these and i look at their track record and i listen to the other things they're doing i posted this on milkman several months ago i just happened to be uh, scanning the dial in my truck, uh, heading back from the west end of the city, and I happened to catch the oldie station that my FM owns out of Arnprior. I couldn't stop listening to this radio station. It The music was like nobody's playing this stuff. I knew every single song. The imaging was tighter than a fart in church. The jingle package was spot on. The announcers were short, sweet, to the point they knew the music. It was like, what is this? And I haven't had that happen to me in a long time. Well, that's their oldie station, and they're doing that oldies format in other markets as well. So, yeah, once I peel back the layers on this, I have to be optimistic that there are people out there who see a future in radio who want to do something with it. They've looked at these specific properties, and they've said, let's give this a solid run. So, yeah, I am. I'm optimistic. So if the headline that day wasn't, Radio no longer a viable business. What if someone, or what if the quote that day had been, we're going to give these radio stations the best chance and the best opportunity to succeed, and we want communities to have vibrant radio stations. Bell just doesn't have it in their DNA to say it. Wouldn't we look at that as being a great day for radio? Just change the one quote from that day. That's all I want. You know what I want? I want radio to get back to celebrating radio. When they hired Tarzan Dan, I didn't get a press release. I didn't get an email from Bell. I had to see that on Tarzan Dan's page. Why is radio not moving heaven and earth to make sure that people who celebrate and promote the shit out of radio are fed as much information as they can about It's It's an afterthought. Oh, it's on our Twitter. It's on our corporate page. Mm -hmm. well, well, no. Feed the beast here. I'm not trying to pick on Bell. They're not the only ones guilty of this. It just doesn't happen in the radio industry or the TV industry anymore. We're not celebrating what we do. We're not patting ourselves on the back. We're not championing the industry. We're letting, you know, just, you know it's on Facebook. It's on Twitter. Everything's fine. You know, the word is out there. Oh, I remember we would do something good, and I said, did... 
Did you get a press release out and did you send it to Milkman? I can probably count yeah, on two hands the number of press releases I got in all of 2023. Mm-hmm. Isn't that a sad commentary? It's bizarre. Matt, I, I mean, we're, we're recording this on Wednesday. I don't think I've, yeah. like, and I sit here every single day, you know, when Milkman gets quiet and there, that happens sometimes. There's no job postings, whatever else, you know, they will come back. But you're telling me that in the past five days, I haven't had anything to update on Milkman because an entire industry has done nothing noteworthy for a week there's got to be something there's got to be a great you give show me that two... connected with an audience there's got to be a fundraiser that happened there's got to be something a ribbon cutting it's crickets man it's crickets we got to change i will that. send you a, i'm going to send you a press release in two weeks okay all right you can have it exclusively for 24 hours i'll let you have it exclusive how about that okay <laughs> Two you weeks. can't tease me like that and not give me a hint as to what that might be about. Two weeks. <laughs> He's got two, two weeks to figure it out. Okay. I, well, I'll invent something. <laughs> I mean, this, this it's ratings. Let's come up with something, right? Let's invent something. New Cap, we're the experts at that. How many press releases were we getting when New Cap had their fugitive on the loose? Oh, you know, right. and on and on and on. And those, yeah. you know, those great little things that just, you know, we, listen, we, we were cool FM in Ottawa. We were the big Top 40 station in town. We, you know, we were up against Energy 1200. The mission, of course, was, you know, it's AM. Doesn't sound as good. And put that old pet to sleep. Yeah. And then along came Hot 89.9. <laughs> and I mean, it, they were in our face all the time. And I, you know, listen, when, when you see that coming at you, you're overwhelmed by it. But the radio fan in you also goes, oh, hell yeah. Oh, this is Man. great. What happened to that? What happened? Well, I think I know. Okay. Well, we, we're going to put out a press release. We're going to need to run that by a number of people. All right. And by the time it comes back, it's already passed and happened. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> it's it's like it's old. Like you, there's no. It's too difficult to get stuff into the moment because you got to run it by HR and then you got to run it by legal and then you got to get approved. Well, and, we're going to need some what? changes. I, and, I know you're you're kind of kidding, but I also know you well enough to know that you're not. That's kind of the process now, isn't it? That's what. But that's what happened many times. In that chain of command. Like by the time it, it just, came back, it just I'm like falls on deaf ears. It just it doesn't matter enough to one person in in the food chain, and it just yeah. goes nowhere. It's sad. Uh, Billy and Legal was sick, uh, <laughs> but they came back a week later Billy? and have now approved this. I, I go. We're done. We're, it's over. I love that we're Bill, not doing this anymore. I love that Billy, Billy works in legal. Billy in legal. Mm. That's right. William. Yes. You mean William? Yes, better. Yeah. Hey, you're still a CFL fan. You like the Red Blacks? Uh, you think the CFL got hate their act together with my Red yeah. Blacks? But yes. Does the CFL have their act no. together yet with social media? No. no okay. What a no, disaster. No, did no. you see what Saskatchewan why, did? Why did I ask a question I knew the did answer to? Did you see to? what Saskatchewan did? Did they? Whatever they did, they probably did it on dial-up. They sent an email to their season ticket base about a day ago, and some video campaign. I'm, I'm still trying to get my eyeballs on this thing. It's been removed from the interwebs, but girl math. That's the big sales pitch to try and get to a new base of fans, the female audience girl math and apparently i haven't seen it but from everything i've read it was just this condescending macho they're taking a lot of heat for it do you go to a lot of winnipeg games i don't but i love the team uh and i was not watch. to love you got a great team going there you know what for years they were not good and now they are the model franchise I love it. Listen, but I'm still an Alouettes fan. That's right. Eh? That's that's. I had to sit in a corner to watch the game mm. this year. I had to sit in the back corner by myself and cheer the Owls on. Uh, you know, in a room full of Bomber fans. I haven't been to another CFL city for some time, but when I go to Red Blacks games, and I was a season ticket holder for a long time. We've got this refurbished stadium, et cetera, and they want to knock down the north side stands now and rebuild it. And it's just, it's not entertaining. The value for the dollar is just not there. There's no halftime mm. show, the audio. It's not that the audio system itself is bad, but the audio that they're playing, the songs they're playing, etc., all seem to be recorded at different levels, and they're distorted, and it's just... Like, they don't even make popcorn at the stadium anymore. Like, the smell of popcorn doesn't exist. And it just... For me, the whole experience of the CFL falls flat. I find the broadcast is... And it's unfair, I know, to do this to the CFL, but when you... look Like it or not... You're in the football business. You're up against the NFL. You know, go back to, you know, you're not even trying radio. Well, the CFL broadcasts to me are very laid back. It, it, it's, it, and I, I've often joked about it. it kind of sounds like golf when I'm watching mm-hmm. CFL broadcasts. I'd like the excitement level up a little bit. 
I still support the CFL. I go to games when I can. Um, listen, you, you, you say that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers weren't good for a lot of years. Uh, try being an Ottawa Rough Rider fan through the Gleiberman years and Horn Chen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the Renegades days, it was painful. But I'm glad the team is back. I don't see them making any moves. I, they, again, there's just there's no excitement in the city. You, you just don't hear anything. And again, they've got that relationship where it seems that all of their eggs are in one basket. They're, they're advertising, as far as I can tell, exclusively on TSN 1200. If I'm a sports nut, I'm probably already aware of when the games are. There doesn't seem to be too much effort to get out there to the fans that may not necessarily know, but are looking for a thing to do with the kids for the weekend. Missed opportunities again. I have lost track over what stations still exist. Do you still have an Ottawa sports station at 1200? TSN 1200 and CFRA, both Bell Media stations, they are the only AM stations left in Ottawa. And you got to figure, you know, Bell Media as a business has to be taking a look at those. Hmm. News, as we've already discussed, and CFRA is a news talk station. That's an expensive thing to run. This is the CRTC who should have fixed that. They should be allowing stations on FM. Well, I don't need 15 stations playing music at me. No. Just um, put some put some news on FM. So my question to you, maybe you know more about this than I do, because I know CFRA and TSN 1200 are both uh, available on HD through Pure Country and through, I still call it Magic, but through Move. Can they exist as just an HD station or do they need to maintain that AM transmitter i don't know but can we just put this thing on fm or that well there's not a lot of, i don't think there's a lot of room in ottawa on the fm band they would be a very low power radio station if they were on fm because rebel had that problem too when they first launched and they had to trade frequencies with a university station on the quebec side in order to up their power so camp fortune is where the big transmitter is most stations uh, the earlier stations, anyway, they're 100,000 watts beaming off the top of Camp Fortune, and they're blowtorch radio stations that I know you probably heard a little bit when you were in Montreal even. They, they would bleed into that market. There's a lot of overlap and crossover there. Stations like Live 88.5 that Stingray owns, um, Rebel, uh, I believe the Christian station, they've had to go to a transmitter um, to the south end of the city, which would put them lower, and I know Rebel for a long time didn't have enough power to even you know find an audience in office buildings downtown. They change the frequency, they were able to up their power a little bit. So I don't know if there's frequencies left that they could have the same opportunity to succeed. I'm not asking Bell to move it, although it would be nice, because that's expensive. I get that. I mean, just looking at that, that's expensive. But if I wanted to start up a a news station or a talk station even, what if I just wanted to have a talk station? I'm not even allowed to do it. And we know Chorus already has a hankering for moving some of those legendary AM stations over to FM. They've tried it. So just let them. Well, and to Chorus's credit... I know that they haven't had permission to move the talk stations to FM, but they're doing it. And and it's kind yeah. of, I view it as kind of a, oh yeah? Tell me I can't. Go ahead. Let, let's have that public war. Like, in order for my business to survive, I have to make this move. You say I can't. I'm saying it's time you lo- that. I applaud that. If the CRTC is not going to listen, okay, you got to do what you got to do to save your business. I would have no problem putting talk on FM. Absolutely, in a heartbeat. Yeah. Every, everything well, I feel sh- bad everything w- should be FM or digital going forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't want to throw the blame at all the radio people because there oh. is an enabler in all this, and that's the CRTC. Yes. You can only work within the rules, right? That's right. What are you looking forward to this summer? You know what, Matt? How long has it been now since I have been on my own? Is this summer nine or summer Nine 10? plus years? Honestly, this is summer 10 coming up. In every single contract that I have with radio stations to voice shows for them. For the first time in 10 years, I have said, I get two weeks from me. I have not given myself a real vacation for 10 years. So this summer, I'm looking forward to being at the cottage in New Brunswick, the BTRV parked outside because my in-laws live in the cottage, but walking that beach on the Bay of Fundy with the dog and my wife and just, you know, getting caught up and just some of the other things that John actually is, you know, picking up the camera again and doing photography. I love nature and landscape photography. Traveling. I, you know, I, I've been going to the east coast of this country for 30 years every summer. I've never been to PEI. I, I've never... What? I know. I've not been to Cape Breton. What? Okay, They're wait a second. right I'm not there. Gonna... I know. I've been to the bridge. I have been on the New Brunswick side of the bridge. I didn't go over it. Yeah. I know. It's wrong. And so I, I want to start doing some of those things, especially now... Look, the BTRV is for the radio station, but we take it with us. So I've got a thing with me that really allows me to go anywhere. Why aren't I? Well, I'm going to start doing that kind of stuff. 
55 changes you, too. You start looking at things a little bit differently. You know, your bucket list starts getting a little more real. You know, stuff I got to do. So I'm just I'm just looking forward to um, paying myself finally. The end of this show sounds like a London Life ad for Freedom 55. <laughs> How did this happen? There is no freedom at 55. I'm here to tell you I'll be working, loving what I do till the day I die, Matt Gundle. You know what? Me too. It's passion. Me too. And that's, that's yep. again, that's what's lost on a lot of people, I think, who have been in this business sometimes. This is passion. Look, I, I, Lowell Green. I had Lowell Green on well into his 80s. Why did he want to do it? Because he just doesn't have any, he just, he doesn't want to sit around the house and do nothing. We're a passion business. And ain't it great? Mostly. It is. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you and I appreciate all the things you do for, for Canadian radio. Likewise, Matt. I'm a big fan of what you do. Rest assured, I know we don't necessarily talk all the time, but you've always been very good to me, always very candid with me, and I'm watching what you're doing. I really have great appreciation for a lot of the interviews I've seen, especially Terry DeMonte. Um, i got a great Terry DeMonte story I'll share with you one day. Gosh, the list just goes on and on and on and on. Um, you know, great little things like that that are reminders. And, and just so you know, this is the influence you're having on me. So I'm doing, what, seven shows a day for radio stations? Little things like the conversation you had with Erin Davis, where you and she talked about sitting down with Valerie. And very quickly, Valerie heard one of your breaks and said, that's great, but how can we make this more impactful? And just taking the time to rewrite and restructure and you reminded me of one of the things I used to teach when I was uh, at Algonquin College filling in for a couple of semesters. The most powerful word we can use in radio is you. And and this is what I found ever since hearing that conversation with Aaron, and thank you for it. It reminded me that I need to get back to, especially in a voice track capacity, where it can feel very disjointed and not connected if you're not in that community but if you just restructure the break and say have you ever do you do this suddenly you're their buddy again and it's a simple little thing that i think you know radio can be looking at to do uh to reconnect with an audience and and you brought that to me and i'm sure to many others so thank you for what you do for radio thanks man appreciate you go team the Sound Off Podcast is written and hosted by Matt Kundle. Produced by Evan Serminski. Edited by Chloe Emil Lane. Social media by Aiden Glassy. Another great creation from the Sound Off Media Company. There's always more at soundoffpodcast.com.